One of the most interesting circuits you can build in the AC circuits chapter is the LC circuit, which is the assembly of a capacitor and an inductor, and the result is that the charge contained within the circuit is actually going to oscillate freely back and forth from the capacitor to the inductor as time goes by. And because there is no resistance to dissipate any energy over time, energy will be conserved, hence the fact that you get free, undamped oscillations. And so we'll start by conceptually explaining the LC circuits so that we understand where the oscillations come from. We'll then apply the loop law and derive the differential equation that dictates the behavior of the charge throughout the circuit. And we'll explain the expression for the charge stored on the capacitor and the current flowing back and forth through the circuit. And then we'll talk about conservation of energy and we'll show that the initial energy contained in the capacitor remains constant over time, even though charge goes back and forth. And again, that's because there is no resistor to dissipate any energy over time. So let's start with the LC circuit problem. The simplest way to construct this is actually to have a capacitor that is already charged and has an amount of charge, let's call it Q0, stored on its plates, and you're then going to connect it to an inductor. So you have a switch here, and at time t equals 0, you close the switch. And let's say, for the sake of argument, that the top plate of our capacitor has positive charge. Well, all these positive charges repel each other, and they cannot wait to get out of there. And so they're going to try to flow out of the capacitor and create a current. However, there was no current initially, and now all of a sudden, the capacitor wants to create a current, but inductors don't like that. Inductors don't like when the current changes abruptly. And so what the inductor is going to do is induce an EMF across itself and generate an induced current that is going to oppose the current I exactly. And so what happens in this case is that the two currents cancel at t equals zero plus, and the net current through the circuit is zero. Now that actually makes sense because Vc is going to be exactly equal to Vl, and therefore Vl is going to drive initially an induced current that exactly is going to counter the current I that would want to flow out of the capacitor. However, over time, the capacitor is going to win because some charge is going to be able to leave eventually, and as time moves on, the change seen by the inductor gets smaller and smaller. And so certainly it's true that as charge leaves the capacitor, the voltage Vc is going to drop. And so here we're going to have a current I through the circuit. And of course, if Vc drops, then Vl also drops because Vl is always equal to Vc. And that means that while well, the inductor is fighting a little less. And so what we have is a current that grows over time as long as there's charge on the capacitor plates. But at some point, the top plate of the capacitor is depleted. And so when you get to that point where Q is equal to zero here, all of a sudden, the current goes away. But inductors don't like that. And so the inductor that now has the current flowing through it, in fact, the max current, has a magnetic field within its coils. And in that magnetic field, there's energy. And so it's going to draw from that magnetic field to maintain the induced current, or rather to maintain the current thanks to an induced current, so that the charge continues to flow clockwise around this circuit. And that continues. But as that happens now, you start to build up positive charge on the bottom plate of the capacitor. Right? Now, there's still going to be current flowing clockwise. It's still bringing charge onto the bottom plate of the capacitor. But it's slowing down because now it gets harder to bring the charge to the capacitor because these charges here don't like each other. They repel each other. And so it gets harder and harder to push charge onto the bottom plate of the capacitor. Eventually, 
that plate is full. And once it's full, well, you find yourself in the same situation that you had initially, where all of the charge that used to live on the top plate of the capacitor now lives on the bottom plate. So it's the same situation, of course, flipped, the polarity is flipped, but VC starts to increase in the other direction here, and eventually the value that you get for VC once all of the charge has moved to the bottom plate of the capacitor is the same in magnitude as the value that you had initially here. And so now, on the bottom plate, we have Q0. All of the charge that was stored on the top plate of the capacitor has moved to the bottom plate. And as a result, I net is equal to zero because you can no longer bring charge onto the bottom plate, but that charge hasn't yet started to leave the bottom plate, but it will. And so, in fact, the same scenario plays out in reverse. So you can go clockwise through these circuits, but then, of course, you could argue that you can play the movie backwards, and ultimately you're going to end up with the charge Q0 right back on the top plate of the capacitor. And this goes on and on and on and on. And in fact, it never ends. The reason it never ends is because there is nothing to burn off energy. Now, technically, not true, right? The wires have a little bit of resistance, so in practice, if you construct this circuit, it's not going to go on forever. But if you idealize everything and you say that you have ideal wires, like we say here, then there is no reason why the oscillation of the charge should stop. So let's see, now that we understand how the LC circuit works, if we can describe this mathematically. And to do that, we'll do what we've done all along, which is write the loop law. And by the loop law, we know that VL is equal to VC. That means that minus L di dt is equal to vc, well that's just q divided by c. And recall, by the way, that i is dq dt. So what do we get? We get l di dt plus q over c is equal to zero. And we can do one better, because if i is dq dt, then di dt is really d2q dt squared plus q over c. And here's our differential equation. We need to put it in standard form, which we do by dividing by L, so that we clear whatever's in front of the highest order derivative here. And so we get d2q over dt squared plus q over lc is equal to zero. Actually, let me even do it this way. Let's write 1 over lc times q. This, of course, is the same thing. But it makes it easier to compare to the standard form. So let's box this because this is the differential equation that governs this circuit. This is the harmonic oscillator equation, by the way. And recall that the standard form is, let's call it x to be generic, d2x dt squared plus omega squared x is equal to zero. That's the standard form. Meaning that whatever here sits in front of q is omega squared, which is the angular frequency squared of this circuit, meaning that from that we can get the frequency in the period. So the angular frequency of an LC circuit is 1 over square root of LC. That's important in and of itself. And if we recall that omega is equal to 2 pi f, 
Well, then we find that the frequency at which the charge is going to oscillate back and forth is equal to omega over 2 pi. That's 1 over 2 pi square root of LC. And of course, we can get the period from that because it's just 1 over f, so that's going to be t is 2 pi square root of LC. All right, so that's just period and frequency and angular frequency. Let's write the solution of this differential equation which is going to be q of t. Let's just put this here as a reminder and say that q of t is going to be either in cosine or sine form, whichever one, but it's going to be q0, that's the maximum charge that you can get, so it's the amplitude when it comes to the oscillating charge, cosine of omega t plus phi sub c, or q0 sine of omega t plus phi sub s. And that's exactly what we reviewed when we went over this differential equation. That's the form of the solution. Now recall, of course, that i is dq dt. So that means that i of t is equal to dq dt, and we get two different expressions depending on whether we start with the cosine version of q of t or the sine version of q of t. So here we're going to get minus q0 omega, don't forget the chain rule, sine omega t plus phi sub c, or omega q0 cosine of omega t plus phi sub s. And of course it doesn't matter. You can pick one of the two for q of t. Once you have, though, just stick with your choice and be consistent. Now why do we do this? Well, it's important to be able to at least write q of t from recognizing the differential equation. In other words, if you're able to derive the differential equation from the loop law, you should be able to state the form of the solution. So that's what we did there. Now we also did I of t because we want to use this in order to write conservation of energy. So conservation of energy is going to look like this. We're going to write the energy at time t equals zero right before we close the switch. And all of the energy is going to exist in the capacitor because all of the charge lives in the capacitor. And then we're going to say that at any given moment in time, energy is going to be distributed between the capacitor that has some of the charge left over and the inductor, because there's current going through it, and the sum of the two should add up to whatever amount we had initially. So we're going to say, by conservation of energy, that U capacitor at t equals zero plus U inductor at t equals zero is going to be equal to u capacitor at any time plus u inductor at any time. And again, there is no energy stored in the inductor initially because there's no current going through the inductor initially before you close the switch. And all of the energy is stored in the capacitor because it carries all of the charge q0. So we have q0 over 2c plus 0 is equal to, well then what is the expression for uc and for ul. Well, there's a few versions that you can write for uc, but maybe you would write it q of t squared over 2c to keep the same formula that you had here, plus one half l i of t squared. And so that's conservation of energy in general. You can relate the amount of energy stored in the circuit initially to the sum of the energy stored in the capacitor and in 
the inductor at any time. It's pretty convenient, actually. If you can solve by applying conservation of energy, it's a lot easier than doing the complicated math with the functions q of t and i of t. So it's something to keep in mind that's pretty useful. And just as a sanity check, let's show that this is valid because we have the expressions above for i of t and q of t. Now you can pick whichever version you want. I'm going to go with the cosine version for q of t. And so I'm going to write that q of t is q0 cosine of omega t plus v sub c. And i of t is the corresponding expression, which is minus q0 omega sine of omega t plus v sub c. All right, let's plug that into here and show that if you do the math, you actually get q0 squared over 2c. That should convince us that this all ties out. So let's start with q of t squared over 2c plus 1 half l i of t squared. All right. Now, that's going to be 1 over 2c q0 squared, cosine squared of omega t plus v sub c. And then plus 1 half of L, and if we square i of t, the minus goes away, and we get q0 squared, omega squared, sine squared of omega t plus v sub c. Now to simplify that further, Recall that omega squared is actually 1 over LC. Now that means that we can substitute that in the second expression and simplify things a little more. So we have Q0 squared over 2C, cosine squared of omega T plus V sub C, plus 1 half of L q0 squared, 1 over lc, that's omega squared, sine squared of omega t, plus v sub c. The l cancels out. And now we have q0 squared over 2c cosine squared of omega t plus v sub c, plus q0 squared over 2c sine squared of omega t plus v sub c, which is nice because now we have a common factor, q0 squared over 2c. And if we recall that for any x, sine squared x plus cosine squared x is equal to 1, all we have to do is factor out q0 squared over 2c, and then we get the sum cosine squared plus sine squared which is going to be 1. And so ultimately, we get q0 squared over 2c. I mean, if you're not convinced, just to be thorough here, it's going to be multiplied by this quantity here plus this quantity here. And the point is that this sum is equal to 1. That's the argument. So we get, ultimately, that the expression that we started with, which is the sum of the energy in the capacitor and in the inductor at any time, is indeed equal to the energy stored in the capacitor initially. Thanks for watching this video. At Congress Academy, we create custom study guides so that you don't have to. Send us your syllabus and some old exams, and we'll put together lecture notes practice problems with step-by-step -step solutions and classic exam questions so that you don't waste your time. All you have to do is log in and focus on studying what matters most. And if you have questions, we're available to help. If you'd like to learn more about how Congress Academy can help you do well, check us out at congressacademy.com. We look forward to helping you. See you there.